So, hello and welcome to the third day of GPN. Um, I, I guess I can still t uh, tell good morning to everyone because we are at a hacker conference. So I, I'm I'm not up that early. <laughs> we are here to uh, listen to some um, yeah new things regarding Go that you can do on a Raspberry Pi for whatever you want to do on a Raspberry Pi. We had a quick. Uh, yeah, question here, here, a lot of people have a Raspberry Pi in the audience and a lot of people do home automation and a little backup on there. And I'm hoping that there is a new way of doing that. Maybe some uh, of you will then uh, go there. But without further ado, I'm here to introduce Michael. He will yeah, tell you a little bit more about it. And a warm, warm applause uh, for him. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, so the title of this talk is Build Go Appliances for the Raspberry Pi Using Go Crazy. So first I'm going to give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about. First of all, I'm going to introduce what is Go Crazy, and I'm going to do that by showing you a couple of different aspects of the system, like how does it work, but also notably how does it look and feel like when you use it. I'm going to show a quick demonstration of how you would just install it and get started. I'm going to talk about which hardware you can use it with um, and how we implemented fully automated Linux kernel updates. Then we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about a couple of notable Go Crazy appliances. So these would be things that other people have built that you might find interesting and want to run. Then we're going to talk about notable Go software that you can run. So if you want to build your own appliance, but you don't want to like write your own programs, you could decide to just use existing Go programs and run them in an appliance setting. And then we're going to talk about building your own stuff with Go Crazy because you know the, the conference here is called Gulasch Programmiernacht, so we better do some programming, right? Um, and then a very quick uh, outlook to future developments, and we're going to have some time for questions and answers at the very end. All right, so let's jump right in. What is Go Crazy? Well, I told you already it's for appliances. You can use it to deploy your Go programs as appliances to a Raspberry Pi or a PC. What do I mean when I say an appliance? An appliance is sort of the opposite of a general purpose computer. So with a general purpose computer, you just get like, let's say maybe a, an Ubuntu or a Debian installation or what have you, and you can add anything and everything you want, right? Um, an appliance sort of looks at it from a different way. It's not like you want a broad based computing platform and then you can do anything and everything. It's like you have the one program that you really want to run and you don't really care about all of the rest that is typically part of, let's say, an Ubuntu system. So specifically, Go Crazy is 100% written in Go, right? And what do I mean by that? The only non-Go parts of the entire system are the Linux kernel itself, which you might know is written in C, and it would be futile to try to re-implement it, right? We really want to use what the Linux kernel already offers. Um, and then there is the Raspberry Pi bootloader, which, you know, if you're into the Raspberry Pi, you might know you need these binary files in order to start up the system. Um, but aside from these two components, there is no C user land on the device. This means there's no glibc, there's no open SSL with security vulnerabilities. There are no package managers. There's nothing like that, right? There's only the Go programs that you decide should be on the device. So the philosophy is sort of a, you know, build minimally from the ground up and add only what you need. And that way also keep the complexity and the attack surface very low and self-constrained, right? Notably also, like why is it written in Go or what does that give you? Well, you can enjoy all of the strengths of Go uniformly for the entire system. This means that all of the components are managed as Go modules. So if you think, oh, there's like a little bug or a little feature missing in the DHCP client of Go Crazy, you can just say, okay, I'm just going to take that Go module, change a couple of lines of source code and then deploy it very quickly, right? Um, so in order to do that, you would use the same replace directive that you might already know from working with Go. Also, you'll have all of the other strengths, and to pick just one that I personally like very much, um, that would be the very quick compilation times. So working in a system that is written in Go is great for interactive development. It's very quick to make progress, um, and the same is true for Go Crazy, and I'm going to show you in a little bit. But first, um, I want to show you this uh, demonstration video to give you an idea about the look and feel. Welcome to this quick demonstration of how to first install Go Crazy on your Raspberry Pi. 
I'm going to assume that you have already done the preparation work of installing Go and installing the Go Crazy CLI. I have prepared an entirely empty SD card and we're going to jump straight to step two of creating a new Go Crazy instance. With the GOG new command, we can see that we now have a new instance created and we can use the GOG override command to write it to the empty SD card. Now I'm going to insert the SD card into my Raspberry Pi. Now that the Raspberry Pi has started up, we can copy and paste the link that the GoCrazy CLI gave us to open up the web interface of GoCrazy. Let's add another program to this GoCrazy instance. We're going to use the webstat command And this time, instead of using GOG override, we're just going to say GOG update. Now that the device is back, we can reload the web interface. And indeed, we see the webstat command has been added. And it should now be available on port 6618. And indeed, we now see the same output in our web browser as on the connected monitor. All right. So I think um, this should give you a good overview of what it feels like to use it. Now let's explain in a little bit of detail what happened. Uh, what did we just see? So the stuff that we're writing onto the SD card on disk, what's happening here? Well, you enter an empty SD card or you're just going to overwrite the existing contents of it. And then GoCrazy is going to add four different partitions. The first partition is called the boot partition. On this one, you will have the bootloader files. I already mentioned for the Raspberry Pi, you need these binary blobs to start it up. Um, if you're installing Go Crazy on a PC, you don't need those. And then the boot partition is your EFI ESP, right? Um, Go Crazy also supports the older MBR based uh, boot protocol instead of only UEFI. Then after the boot partition, you have not just one root partition, but you have two root partitions. These are called root A and root B, and they're using an A-B update scheme so that typically the first time you write it, so in the demo that we just did, we have written boot and root A, and then with the gog update command that we used, we actually wrote the new system to root B so that if anything goes wrong in the update, we would still have a bootable system. And then in the reboot, it switches over um, to start from root B and then the next update goes to root A and vice versa, right? So it's a classical AB update scheme and the actual contents of the root file system are read-only compressed SquashFS images. So the idea here is that most of your appliance typically is stateless. But obviously, you can only get so far with a stateless system, and then typically you will want to store some configs, some data, some what have you. For that, you will have the fourth partition for your own usage. Um, this is called a permanent partition, and you can have an X4 file system there, or really any file system that the Linux kernel supports out of the box. So you could also use ButterFS if you wanted to, but you cannot, for example, use ZFS because it's not part of the Linux kernel. It's a separate module that we don't support yet. So the fourth partition, you can do with it whatever you want. You can also say, oh, I don't want a file system on there at all. I just want to directly write to the block device if you have strange uh, custom use cases. Um, that's entirely up to you. Go crazy only manages boot and root. All right, so what happens with that SD card once you plug it in? What happens at runtime? Well, first of all, uh, obviously the Raspberry Pi bootloader starts up and then the Linux kernel starts up. And then once uh, control is handed over to us from the Linux kernel, the go crazy init system starts. So the init system is the, the core component of the system that brings up all of the other processes. So this means it supervises the installed programs. So for example, the webstat program that we added in the demo, it will be supervised by the go crazy init system, which means that whenever it exits, because it crashed or something, it will just be restarted, right? It's a very simple supervision mechanism. The init system is very uh, integrated in Go Crazy, meaning it's also the component that displays the web interface that we just saw. So when you click on stop or restart in the web interface, you're directly telling the init system what to do. 
You can also configure it to send the logs of all of the programs centrally to a syslog server. Now, obviously, this depends heavily on your setup, whether that makes sense. If you only have one Raspberry Pi, don't bother with remote syslogging. But as soon as you have like five or 10 or the numbers start to rise, it makes sense to like centrally aggregate and filter. Uh, the inner system is also what provides the network update functionality. So the gok update command, it will send over the new stuff to that system, which will then write it and reboot into it. Aside from the init system, the only components that we really, really need are a DHCP server and an NTP client. So the DHCP server is for IP address com uh, configuration so that the device can actually participate in your home network or in the internet. And the NTP client is required because the Raspberry Pi does not actually have a real-time clock that would uh, survive across a power loss. Right? So whenever you start up a Raspberry Pi, you will need to set its clock from scratch, which is why those are like the three components that you really need in the user land on the Raspberry Pi. Then there's one other component which also gets added by default, which is going to be very handy if you develop anything on GoCrazy, and that's uh, a component that we call Break Glass. Uh, it's used for interactive debugging, and it is a, an SSH server. It's GoCrazy's SSH server. It's called Break Glass because you sort of break the glass of the model, right? The model is you have like a stateless appliance, you have only Go code, there's no like C code running on there. With Break Glass, you're starting up uh, an SSH server that's still written in Go, but then it starts up a BusyBox statically compiled environment, which is uh, you know an embedded Linux tool set for those who haven't used it, which is written in C. And the whole idea of Break Glass is that you bring your own software, right? So this is like, I'm going to say remote code execution as a service, but for a good purpose, right? Um, so you could, for example, if you want to debug, I don't know, what your syscalls, uh, your program is doing, you could use strays. If you want to debug what's happening on the network, you would copy over TCP dump. And that way, even though the system is very small and self-contained by default, you can still add all of these useful tools that you might need during development, right? All right, um, so now that we established what happens on disk and when you start it up, where can you actually plug in that disk, right? Which hardware is supported? The first device that um, was supported by GoCrazy is the Raspberry Pi 3. You might wonder why exactly version 3? Why didn't we start sooner or later? And the Pi 3 was the first ARM64 Pi that was supported by the upstream Linux kernel. So uh, in case you're not familiar, Upstream Linux is developed like you know, for all of the devices, whereas the Raspberry Pi Foundation maintains their own fork of the Linux kernel that is specifically targeting only the Raspberry Pi. For the longest time, it was necessary that if you wanted to use the Pi, you would need to boot the kernel provided by the Raspberry Pi Foundation. You couldn't just use any arbitrary Linux kernel. Uh, the downside of that is that whenever there's security issues in the Linux kernel, you need to wait until the fixes have propagated to the Raspberry Pi kernel foundations, uh, the Raspberry Pi foundations kernel fork. Um, and that was a delay that we didn't want. So we thought it would be nicer if all of the components could be updated very quickly, including the Linux kernel. So we were so happy to see that uh, with the Pi 3, we first had a CPU that was uh, supported by upstream Linux. Then later on came the Pi 4 and also the Pi 0 2W, and all of these are supported and recommended for usage with GoCrazy. You can also install the system on standard PCs. And uh, as long as you have an AMD64 CPU, this can be anything, right? It can be a very small embedded PC, like the PC Engine's APU was sort of my go-to example that I would recommend. Unfortunately, PC Engine's is no longer uh, extending the, the, uh, the series of APU processors, so they're like selling all the stock they have, and then it's game over. So if you want a PC Engine's APU, now's your chance to buy one. Um, but it could also be something more abstract, like a virtual machine. So you can totally run it in like your Proxmox cluster that you have on uh, your home lab or something like that. Um, and as I mentioned already, uh, GoCrazy supports both the more modern UEFI-based boot, um, but also the older MBR boot. Um, so you know whatever embedded PC that you have, as long as it's enough PC-like, you will be able to use GoCrazy. Now, this is the officially supported stuff. And what that means is that whenever there's a new Linux kernel version, it uh, will be automatically built, imported, and then tested on a range of continuous integration devices that I have at my home. 
However, there are also other alternatives, uh, community-supported alternatives, where the community has stepped up to provide the Raspberry Pi Foundation's Linux kernel fork without as much testing. But if you, for example, have an older Pi, like the original one, or a Pi 2, or a Pi 0W, which are not supported by the official upstream Linux kernel, you could still use Go Crazy on these, um, as long as you're okay with using the community-supported kernel. And then lastly, there's also alternatives to the Raspberry Pi, such as the Odroid family of devices, which are also supported, also community supported. So, you know, I can only do so much, but other people are interested in running the system on the other boards, so they're providing the support for that. All right, so typically you don't only want to boot an operating system, you actually want to use some hardware with it. The most common request for hardware that we got was certainly using Wi-Fi. Um, and on the Pi, the situation is that Wi-Fi is the same chip as the Bluetooth chip. It's like an integrated thing. Um, so as soon as we add a Wi-Fi support, um, we can also use Bluetooth. Now, let me qualify this a little bit. Um, we have had Wi-Fi support since the very beginning, just not encrypted Wi-Fi. And, you know, people really want to use encrypted Wi-Fi typically. Um, and that was pretty hard because we thought you would need to use a WPA supplicant or something to do the Wi-Fi cryptography. And turns out there's actually a cool feature uh, which is called handshake offloading where the Linux kernel tells the firmware, in this case like the Cypress or Broadcom firmware of the Raspberry Pi, hey, why don't you do the crypto? And then you have a very nice API with which you can just connect to a Wi-Fi network. So since March 2022, you can use encrypted Wi-Fi on all of the supported Go Crazy Raspberry Pi models. The configuration is very easy. You just give it like this JSON file for a configuration. Um, and then I mentioned you can also use Bluetooth, but I do want to qualify that because what you can use is the Bluetooth low energy part. So this is called BLE and uh, devices that will be popular with it are any sort of IoT sensors, right? You have like a temperature sensor, humidity sensor, that sort of stuff. They use BLE, but what you cannot use is like a full Bluetooth stack. So don't expect to like connect your wireless keyboard or your headphones or stuff like that, because for those you need like a lot more software components, which are just not available in Go because nobody has bothered to write a Bluetooth stack from scratch in Go. Um, so those are sort of the limits, um, but encrypted Wi-Fi works uh, and that's very exciting. So then I mentioned we have automated Linux kernel updates. And I want to talk a little about that. The goal here is to make new Linux releases available as soon as possible. So you know, whenever there's a new Linux minor or major release, um, usually they will also address some things security critical, not always, but usually. Um, so we want to pull in these fixes ASAP, right? Um, because, you know, don't run unpatched stuff in your home network. Um, and the idea here was to make it really as easy as possible. So the way we designed the automation is to actually mirror what a human would do if the human were to import a new version manually. So we have a daily cron job that is running on GitHub Actions. It looks for whether there's new releases on kernel.org. And if so, it submits a GitHub pull request, which just changes the URL from which the kernel is supposed to be built. Then that pull request triggers a GitHub action CI run. The automation builds the new Linux kernel, which, by the way, is built reproducibly. So it really doesn't matter if I'm building it on GitHub CI or I'm building it on my local machine or any of you is building it on their laptop. It will be bit for bit identical. Um, then the newly built kernel will be added to the existing PR, which will then be force pushed. That triggers another run of the whole GitHub Actions CI um, automation, which then goes on and deploys the newly built kernel on these sacrificial Raspberry Pis that are running in my living room. Um, so for those, they're just there to support the CI infrastructure. It doesn't really matter if I brick them. Um, so it's better that I brick them where it doesn't matter rather than you brick them where you're going to be sad afterwards, right? So if those devices boot and pass the test suite successfully, and they're all hooked up to like a serial port on the coordinator, um, then the PR automatically gets merged. And at that point, you as user can pull in the new kernel versions, right? And the beautiful thing about this is that if any of these steps fails, it's very obvious where it failed and how you continue, right? Because the automation really does exactly the same steps that I would be doing if I were to manually update the kernel. Now, 
you might be wondering how well this works. And the track record for this automation is that we have most Linux kernel versions available in less than 24 hours. And mostly, this is just constrained on the GitHub Actions uh, cron job running just once per day. If I were to subscribe to kernel.org um, with like a, a pub sub feed, or if I were to poll more aggressively, I bet we could get it down faster. Um, but at some point, you also need to stop. Um, if there are issues in this automation, it typically means that uh, there was a, a, a go crazy specific kernel patch that fails to apply to a new version. And in that case, you would need to change the patch, uh, rebase the patch, or drop the patch, or whatever is the appropriate action. Um, over the last couple of years, we've tried to minimize the patches that we need. And it's only, uh, I'm going to say, less than five or so at this point. Um, so you know, this typically works really well. All right, um, so now that you have a rough overview of you know, how it works, how it feels, where to run it, uh, and what hardware is supported, let's talk about a couple of appliances. Like, what do people actually do with this system? One appliance I want to highlight first is called Conserve. Um, many of you might have like a home lab at home or are responsible for a small rack of computers at work. So you might know that the serial console is very handy as soon as you have an issue with your server where after you rebooted it, it doesn't come back online on the internet and you can no longer log in using SSH. So that's why many people still have a serial console as sort of an out-of-band access mechanism. Now, either you can buy these very expensive serial console appliances or you just build something from scratch if we're only talking about one, two, or a small handful of servers, right? And uh, this is what Conserve is. It's, it's an appliance that uses a, a Raspberry Pi. You plug in via USB a USB to serial adapter. You connect the serial end to your server, and then you can actually SSH into Conserve and directly get onto the serial port, right? So it's not like you would need to log in and then start Minicom, figure out which device, etc. right? No, it's much more convenient and integrated and configurable. Um, what's notable about this particular appliance is that uh, Matt Layer, who wrote it and runs it for his personal home lab, uh, started the project on stream together with me. So if you really want to look at, you know, you're starting from zero, how do you build such an appliance? You can just watch the recording of that stream and you'll be walked through it. All right, so not every one of you might have uh, a serial port on a server or something, but I bet almost every one of you will get physical paper mail in your inbox usually more than once a week. Uh, so maybe you might want to do something about it in terms of organizing it. Like I bet not every one of you is diligently scanning and organizing every mail they get. Maybe you don't need all the mail, but typically you would want a subset. So what I built at some point is an appliance called scan to drive where the idea is that whenever I get a letter in the mail, I just put it into the scanner that you can see on the picture here, and then I push the button, and it automatically will be scanned and uploaded into Google Drive, where the cool thing about that is that um, for the PDFs that you upload into Google Drive, you have full text search automatically using OCR that you don't have to implement yourself. So, you know, from my perspective, I'm just putting it into my scanner. Um, the scan to drive appliance converts the full colored scan into a black and white PDF, compresses it so that it fits into like the, the size limit for OCR on Google Drive, where you can't have more than a couple of megabytes in your PDF, I think, if I remember correctly. And then you can use full text search over you know whatever many years you have stored in there. So if I needed to like pull up an urgent I don't know insurance invoice from three years ago while I'm here for the conference, I could totally do it, right? So this appliance supports the Fujitsu ScanSnap, uh, which is the very model that you see on the picture. Um, I actually implemented a, a driver for it um, in Go for this particular model. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a couple of years old at this point, so many of you will not have this exact model. I think you can't even buy it anymore. The good news is that any AirScan compatible device is also supported. And what does that mean? Well, AirScan is the, the, uh, the standard that Apple introduced and uses for its uh, scanner slash printer support on the iPhone. So if you go into, I don't know, MediaMarkt and you look at which boxes say compatible with the iPhone, you just buy any of those and it will work with scan to drive which is very cool. Um, if you don't want to use scan to drive you can also use just the regular AirScan uh, library or tool, um, both of which are on my GitHub. Under the covers is really just HTTP and, and JPEGs, a very nice small little protocol. So if you have ignored printing and scanning for many years because you just couldn't, um, then have a look at it again. It's much better now. <laughs> you don't need all of the crazy software. All right. Um, 
this is scan to drive, let's ramp it up one level in complexity. This appliance here is called a router 7. Um, you can see the original version on the top right. Um, this is a PC Engine's APU that I mentioned before already. Um, like many of you, I was using OpenWRT for my home router for a number of years. I was using it on a Torres Omnia, which is a nice open hardware router from the Czech Internet Registry. And uh, this was nice because it's also an auto-updating device, but at some point the auto-update feature really annoyed me because in May of 2018, there was an update in the DHCP v6 client which broke my IPv6 connectivity. Now, you might be wondering, well, okay, why didn't you just fix the bug? And I tried. I reported it to the author, and the author said, well, this is sort of a weird edge case. The standard doesn't really cover it. No, I will not fix it. Talk to your ISP. So I talked to my ISP, and the ISP was, well, yes, I mean, the DHCP platform is old, but we're migrating to a newer platform. We cannot help you find weird bugs in the current platform. Um, just wait until the new platform is rolled out. So I can totally understand both the author and the ISP saying, no, we can't fix it. Talk to the other one. Um, but it didn't leave me in like a good position, right? So I figured, well, I could either turn off the auto-updates, which defeats the purpose for which I bought the device, or I could pin the DHCP6 client indefinitely, which defeats the purpose of you know, having auto-updates and security updates and stuff. So I decided it would be fun at this point to just build my own router. <laughs> so I did. Uh, so Router 7 is uh, entirely written in Go. It contains a DHCP client, server, DNS forwarder, all of the different components that you need in order to run your small home network. And because I implemented the entire stack myself, Myself, that also means that I could focus on a couple of goals that I really wanted to try. So, for example, uh, Router 7 is built to maximize connectivity. What does that mean? Typically, if you have a DHCP client and it cannot reach its server anymore, the standard says the DHCP client should expire the lease, not use it anymore, give it back, right? Um, but if you're talking about DHCP between your router and your ISP's access platform, these are like in VLANs anyway, there's no other clients to take care of. So it's actually better to ignore the standard and say, well, I can't really reach the server, but my lease is going to be fine. It'll still keep working. And that actually helps me get over brief connectivity issues like that. Um, so the DHCP servers of my ISP are much better now, luckily. But whenever they had small blips and issues, um, I would just stay online with this approach. Um, the router 7 is also very reliable as its goal and also very debuggable, um, meaning that, for example, if you notice that there is an issue in your local network, so for example, uh, when my girlfriend got a new Mac, it couldn't really connect, and it turns out I had a, a little logic bug in the DHCP stuff. But in order to debug this, um, it was very nice because I could just say, um, OK, I notice now that your computer can't come online. I can just connect using Wireshark to a ring buffer that Router 7 maintains, which will give me the last couple of hours of network configuration traffic retroactively. Right? So, so it's kind of like time travel debugging a little bit, where you don't need to know that you're going to debug something in two hours. You can, at the point when you encounter the problem, just jump back in time and get all of the stuff. And this is very simple to do whenever you're controlling the entire platform, because on the PC Engine's APU, I have a couple of gigabytes of memory. So I don't really care to set aside a 50 megabyte ring buffer to just proactively capture all the network traffic. However, um, for OpenWRT, for example, they run on much, much smaller routers where you don't have that RAM, so you can't easily do that, right? Um, but I found it very uh, instructive and enlightening to see that approach work, as very nice for development. So you might be wondering why the two pictures? Well, the, the picture at the top is the PC Engine's APU. That's sort of the small version with which I started out. As I mentioned, it's a very nice device. You can see it has like a, the serial console at the top. It has a couple of Ethernet ports. Um, you can even connect like a, a little uh, Teensy microcontroller to its power and reset pins, and that way, like really fully automate the, the device. But uh, at a later point, I needed to upgrade um, because my ISP started offering 25 gigabit connections. So I built my own PC. And that's also the reason why Go Crazy now supports both MBR for the PC engines and UEFI for the regular PC. Um, but both are well tested and both work. All right, um, so you don't need to go as far. You don't need to like build your own router from scratch. Uh, nobody's asking that. In fact, you can go the other way. You can say, oh, I, I don't really have a use case to build my own appliance. But there are a couple of cool Go tools that I would like to run. And maybe that's also something for which Go Crazy is interesting to you. So I'm going to list a couple of examples. And the one that I want to start with is called Prometheus. 
Prometheus is a monitoring system and time series database. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, I would encourage you to check it out. It's pretty cool. It comes with a couple of different components. For example, the Prometheus node exporter is the software that you would run on every one of your nodes in your network. So this allows to export metrics, which in turn allows to monitor the Raspberry Pi's CPU usage, RAM usage, whether your disk runs full in a couple of days, that sort of stuff. Right? You can also go one step further and you can run what's called the Prometheus black box exporter, which you can somewhat compare to like traditional monitoring like Nagios or other stuff where you probe targets to ensure they're still good. For example, you could probe your company's website to ensure the SSL certificate is still valid for a couple of days um, and you would get an alert if that's not the case anymore. You can run that on Go Crazy as well and you can even go one step further and you can run the entirety of Prometheus yourself on the Raspberry Pi. Um, so including the time series uh, database storage and all of that stuff, but I would uh, encourage you to use good durable storage, not like a, a cheap SD card that you found in your drawer, right? Because if you write that many time series database updates, you will want to have something that survives for more than a couple of months. Um, so I don't know, use like a, a USB SSD or something like that on your Pi. All right. Um, Let's switch to the next example. Uh, this would be Tailscale, uh, which markets itself as a secure network that just works. Um, to put it into more technical terms, Tailscale is a zero config VPN which uses WireGuard in a mesh network configuration. So that means if I'm here at the conference and I have my laptop and I connect it into Tailscale, um, I can reach the computers in my home network without having to deal with port forwardings, net traversal, and all that sort of stuff. And the traffic doesn't go through a central server it goes directly between my machines. So that's very appealing, and you can also just install Tailscale on Go Crazy. And then as soon as you have installed it, that means the services that you're running on your Raspberry Pi, be it your backup uh, console, your media center, what have you, um, will be available over Tailscale. You can go one step further and you can run it in what's called a subnet router configuration where Tailscale will not only make all of the services on your local Pi available, but all of the services in your entire local area network. So this is very appealing because it means that, for example, for my parents' place, I could just prepare a Raspberry Pi, install Go Crazy, install Tailscale as a subnet router, place it at my parents' place when I'm next visiting, and then just leave it there, update it remotely, and have access to it and all of the other devices, PCs, laptops, printers, tablets, what have you, via the Tailscale subnet router. So very appealing use case, I think. OK, and then most notably, we can also run Docker containers on Go Crazy, And this really is uh, a great feature that we added in April 2022. Um, the reason behind it is that um, Podman is written in Go, while well, Docker mostly is as well. But Podman has the additional advantage that it's available as a standalone static build, which lends itself well to uh, be packaged for Go Crazy, where you don't have you know, most of the traditional components of a Linux system. Um, so we did that in April 2022. And this means that we now have an escape hatch for running non-Go programs on Go Crazy. Uh, you might sometimes need or want to do that. Uh, one of the examples I've put here on the slide is the Ubiquiti Unify controller, which you need to configure the um, Ubiquiti Wi-Fi access points. That's like a pretty complicated thing that uses, I believe, Java, Redis, and a couple of other components. Um, so you can just run that as a Docker container, and then you don't need to install it on any of your systems. You can just run it, right? Um, similarly, maybe it's not so much about third-party software that you just that just isn't written in Go, but maybe it's about older setups, right? And one example I have here is that for chatting on IRC, I still use IRC, which is very old software at this point, but there are a couple of Perl scripts for it that I'm not in the mood to rewrite in anything else. So I've just put that into a Docker container and I'm running that myself, right? Um, so this is very interesting because it means that you can really start using Go Crazy with nothing else but Docker containers and then sort of move all your stuff in there and then gradually replace in Go what you want to replace in Go, um, if at all, right? All right, um, so now you have an impression of uh, you know, what appliances can you build, what software could you just install to build an appliance without really building much, but let's talk about what if you wanted to build something from scratch, right? How does that work? Well, the only thing that you need to supply is a runnable Go program, 
right? Uh, the command line flags with which it will be started, you can customize entirely. You can customize the environment variables. Um, you know, these would be typically the, the stuff that you would expect to be customizable in, you know, traditionally a systemd service unit, but in the case of GoCrazy, just in your GoCrazy instance configuration. There's a couple of more details in terms of um, what environment variables does GoCrazy additionally provide to tell the program where it's running, what's going on, like is this the first attempt at starting it, or um, are we talking about a subsequent attempt after the supervision figured out, hey, you crashed, um, or are we talking about a program which shouldn't be supervised at all? Um, all of these sort of nuances you can look at at our documentation. Um, where the process interface between GoCrazy and you as the software author is clearly defined. Then, aside from the runnable Go program that you provide, um, the, th the stuff that works out of the box is essentially network, right? Because we uh, ship the DHCP client, the, the NTP client. So, um, from your perspective, the program that you write, you can totally use the network, right? You can assume the network is there and working. So one example here um, that I found very instructive is that uh, at some point I needed an MQTT server for my uh, home automation. And I didn't have one, so I looked at which MQTT server is written in Go. I found this one here at github.com slash FHMQ. And I just installed it on Go Crazy, and I didn't have to change anything. I didn't have to set a flag. I didn't have to set environment variables, nothing. I could just run it, and it would just work by default, right? Because the network is there. You connect your devices to the MQTT server, and everything just works. So if you're mostly interested in home automation or in network services and that sort of stuff, um, that's very convenient in Go Crazy. Then in terms of hardware support, what hardware can you actually use? Well, whatever is included in the upstream Linux kernel. Sometimes there might be little surprising differences between um, the Raspberry Pi Foundation's Linux kernel and what is upstreamed, right? Um, but mostly, uh, most of the features that you would expect to work also do work. Um, just last week, for example, um, I merged a pull request from someone who enabled um, USB webcam support for Go Crazy. So, you know, that just works. Um, and another thing that you might want to do is connect uh, GPIO pins on your Raspberry Pi to, I don't know, LEDs, speakers, all that sort of stuff. Um, you could use Perif.io for that, which is like a little Go library for GPIO access. Um, and there's a documentation page about how you would do it, how you would verify that it works using a multimeter, that sort of stuff. All right, um, let's do a little live demo about how to add a new Go package from scratch, right? Um, so let's see. I want to have a terminal here. OK, so here um, I'm in my Go Crazy directory. Um, what I want to do is I want to create a new instance called GPN. So I use gok i gpn new. Um, you've already seen this in the demo, right? So now we can go into the GPN directory. We see there is a config.json, which we have just now created. Um, and um, let me switch back to the slides. So this is the first command, create the instance. The second command is, OK, now we need the actual program. So I'm going to call it hey for hello world. I'm going to say go mod init hey, as you would do typically in Go development. And then we need sort of a minimal program that just does nothing. So this is what it would look like, package main, func main, it's empty. Let's say hey.go. And now I say, OK, use the gok CLI, uh, gok-igpn, and add the current directory to it. Right. Um, so now I can use gok override um, dash dash root temp root dot squashfs and just write it out. Right. So this is what it would look like. And uh, in within a couple of seconds, you have the SD card image prepared. We can see in the resulting file system, there's a lot of system stuff. But then there's also the program that we just added, which, you know, it would be empty. So it doesn't really print anything, doesn't really do anything. But this is what you need to like start with an empty directory. And you can just write your Go code in there, and then it runs on the device, right? All right, so um, once you have that, the interactive development, um, you could use Gok update for it. But um, if you run it in real time, the demo was sort of a little bit accelerated. But if you run it in real time, it takes about 45 seconds on the Pi 4. This, as you just saw, like the, the go crazy part of it is very quick. It generates the entire root file system within a couple of seconds, um, or even less that if you're only changing a little bit of it. But then you need to also transfer that over the network, write it to an SD card, have the Pi reboot, and that all takes a little bit of time. So what I prefer to do, instead of using gok update, which updates the entire thing, is I just use gok run. 
which is a command which just cross-compiles what I'm working on, uploads the resulting program into the RAM of your running Go Crazy instance, and then just restarts that service. So this is like a very quick um, edit run loop where, you know, th if I interactively develop for the system, that's how I do it. Okay, um, so now I've already told you that there's like no C on Go Crazy, right? But that's not actually strictly fully 100% true. There's a couple of escape hatches that you can do if you really want to. If you want to stay Go only, that's fine. You can do it. That's the default. But sometimes you might need like the one C library or the one routine that you have. And one example is for the scan to drive app appliance that I showed you. At some point, I noticed that the image slash JPEG package that comes with Go is a very nice and readable JPEG implementation. So I really recommend you read the source if you're curious about how JPEG works. But it's not as optimized as the other implementations that we have for JPEG. So the standard implementation is libjpeg turbo at this point, And it contains an optimized version that uses the ARM Neon instruction set to really accelerate stuff on the Pi. And this really makes a difference. So this changes the scan time of a single page from, I don't know, 30 seconds to 10 seconds or something on that order of magnitude. So it's really worth it to use the optimized version of this library. But then I told you, OK, Go Crazy is 100% Go, no C user land, no glibc. So how does it work? How can we still use that library? And the answer is that some of the C libraries can be used if they're statically linked, if they have no dependencies on glibc or anything else. right? Um, and libjpeg is a perfect example here, because really, it's like you give it bytes. It does an encoding. It gives you back the bytes. right? It's uh, what we call a compute kernel in the sense that it just does compute. It doesn't have any dependencies on the outside world. So these sorts of libraries you can totally use. You would just build them with like a typical uh, cross-compiler GCC in your environment. And then you specify uh, link mode external. And you give the external linker the dash static flag. Um, and you, know, you, you see it's a bit involved, but you can do it if you want to, uh, is supposed to be the takeaway of this slide. Um, there is one more escape hatch that I want to show you, which is that you know, if, uh, if you want to run C software, maybe temporarily, on the Go Crazy device, you can just put it into a Docker container. But sometimes you don't want that. Sometimes you don't want it containerized and away from the host. Sometimes it really needs to run on your host. What can you do in those situations? Uh, the one example that I have here is uh, TC, the, the traffic shaping and control program on Linux, where if you just run TC, it doesn't support anything. It really needs uh, to dynamically load the traffic shaping plugins at runtime before you can even configure what sort of bandwidth limit you want on your Linux machine. Um, so when I use Router 7 to uh, run an event network, much like this conference network here, um, I wanted to cap the traffic limits uh, to not overwhelm our uplink. Um, and I used TC for this, right? So how did I get TC to run when it obviously needs a C user land to the extent that you can dynamically load code at runtime? Well, there is um, a little helper tool, which we call freeze, which looks at the binary that you want to freeze. And it looks at all of the shared library dependencies. And it freezes those as well. And then it generates like a little tarball that contains your program and all of its library dependencies. And you can just copy that over to your Go Crazy device and run it there. And you know, obviously, that's not great, because the software is frozen. So that means it doesn't get automated updates. right? It's like entirely outside of the system that Go Crazy manages. But this is very helpful for stuff that isn't security critical and doesn't really change. So one example is that we use this approach in order to ship the MKFS program so that we can create the permanent data partition using the X4 file system. We didn't implement like, you know, creating an X4 file system from scratch in Go. We just use MKFS. And it's easy enough to just freeze it because it doesn't really change. All right, um, so with that all out of the way, uh, let's talk a little bit about future developments. And then I want to open it up for questions and answers. Uh, so one project that uh, one of our contributors and I am working on is called GUS, the Go Crazy Update Service. And um, the update flow that you have already seen is sort of the default update flow, the synchronous update flow, where you run GOG update, and it does the update right then and there. But sometimes, that might not fit the model of devices that you have deployed. Uh, so if you have a number of devices that are only sometimes online, you don't necessarily want to coordinate between uh, what you, where you create the update and run it 
um, and where you want to deploy the update, right? So what GUS allows you to do is one to many updates. So you build the image once, you upload it to GUS, and then all of the different Raspberry Pis that are running the same image can come to GUS at their convenience and pull down the update, right? So it just uncouples these two steps. All right, um, so with that, I'm at the end of my slides. Um, there's more information at gocrazy.org. I've also laid a couple of Go Crazy stickers on the table here up front. So if after the presentation you think that's cool, you want to grab a sticker, please feel free. Um, also, if you want to talk about any aspect of Go Crazy, um, feel free to talk to me while I'm still here at the conference. Um, I love talking about the stuff, and I will also give you a sticker as a gift if you want. Um, please also scan the QR code and give me feedback on this presentation either now or later. Um, and with that, I'm going to open it up for Q&A and say thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the great presentation. Um, yeah, the question in the front row, please. Um, this is really cool. Thank you. Right, I'm going to repeat the question for the recording and stream. Uh, the question was, uh, do I develop this on the side or is this like a commercially available thing? Uh, this is entirely a hobby of mine, um, which I'm using for all of my Raspberry Pis and more and more computers at this point, but there's no business behind it. Um, in fact, we've gotten a question at some point where somebody was like, well, you know, I want to build like my IoT system on this, uh, on Go Crazy, like, are you okay with it? And I'm like, look, it has crazy in the name. Do you really want to base anything on this? But if it works for you, be my guess, right? Uh, just, you know, no support other than what I can provide best effort. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Question in the also front. in the front row. Right. Um, yeah, I'm going to repeat for the recording. Um, when did I start with Go and what was my motivation for it? Um, I actually looked at Go when it was first announced uh, in 2009. Um, and then I tried a couple of toy demos and I was like, oh, yeah, this looks cool. And then I put it back um, until Go 1.0 was released in 2012, um, where they introduced what's called the stability guarantee. So all of the stuff that is in Go 1, it will not be broken um, until you know, Go 2, hypothetically. Um, but that was really like, the 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 status like the the signal for me to really use it right in earnest um, so I started building services such as Debian code search um, which I'm still running to this day so if you're interested in searching through open source software using regular expression matching you can go to codesearch.debian.net um, and grab over all of what's in Debian, that is a Go system that I built as my bachelor thesis back then. Um, so I was like, oh yeah, this looks like a natural fit for network services and for that sort of stuff. Um, and I'm enjoying it to this day. Um, and I'm yeah, doing more and more in Go as you can see. Yeah. Question in the second row. Yeah, oh, there's a mic. Can you use the mic? Oh. Yeah. What is your experience regarding the performance of Go? Because you said you wrote some drivers and so on. Is it compatible with C or needs it some fixes or tweaks or something like that? Right. Um, in general, my experience is that the performance of Go is always sufficient and in the very few rare cases where it isn't such as in the hot loop that's encoding the jpegs right um, that's the spots that you find using profiling the profiling story is very good in go so it's very easy to figure out where are your bottlenecks in terms of cpu usage or memory allocation or that sort of stuff and then you implement that uh, more efficiently right um, most often i try to just optimize the go code itself but sometimes if that's really not sufficient like for example if you want to use the arm Neon instruction set for which the Go compiler doesn't have any intrinsic support, um, you will need to use the escape patch and say, okay, now I'm going to you know, use C or I don't know, maybe you could even use Rust or something else and like just pull that into your Go program and you know, keep the rest in Go. Yeah. Um, there's a question at the very back. Yeah. Right. 
right? The question was, is there any separation between the processes and the, the rest of the system, like SecCom or Landlog or that sort of stuff? Um, yes, but you're responsible for it on your own. So, um, for example, the NTP client that I mentioned, um, and I believe also the DHCP client to a lesser extent, um, they use privilege separation. So, you know, they sandbox themselves essentially. So, you know, when you're running on Go Crazy, you get full access, like sort of as root, right, to like anything you want to do with the Linux kernel. But if you think, oh, for this particular use case, SecCom would be great or Landlock would be great, then you can totally do that. Um, but it's something that you need to do yourself. Yeah, there's currently no facilities to make that easier, but I'm also not opposed to adding something at some point if it turns out, oh, most people actually need to implement this and that, it would be nice to have a common helper for it. Um, and another story where it's pretty similar is uh, with the Docker containers that I mentioned, which can also sometimes function as a sort of boundary. Um, for those, uh, you can currently run Docker containers, but there's no sort of container manager or something, which you could configure to just tell it, look, just run this and that. So there's no Docker Compose, essentially, right? Um, so for that, I'm also in the space where it's like, you know, for now, just do it yourself. So because you know what you need, you know it best, right? And if it turns out that there's a common need that we should address with like a central component or a repository or a library or something like that, um, I'm open to add that in the future or to merge that if someone wants to step up and contribute it. Uh, another question in the very front. Right, right. I'm going to try and summarize that for the recording. Um, the question was like, you know, for tail scale, there's head scale. So uh, for other parts of the Go ecosystem, are there other replacements like that? For example, the Go module proxy, which is currently centrally run by Google. Um, fun fact, for this presentation, I actually uh, did use a module proxy that was running on my laptop locally. Um, so that is totally supported. Um, I don't think for the context of Go Crazy that there's really any dependencies like that. Um, you can sort of mix and match everything and anything. So if, for example, you say, well, you know, I don't trust the Google engineers, I want to use a different compiler, you can use GCC Go, right? Um, or you could use uh, Go LLVM or uh, whatever other implementation you have. The Go Crazy system itself is not really tied too much. Um, it does use the Go tool, though, in order to build software, right? Um, so, you know, just getting all of the modules, working with the modules, all of that, we don't implement that ourselves. We reuse what the Go tool already provides. Um, so I think th that would probably be the one dependency that you really have and that you can't get out of. Um, right, that's written in Go and you could provide a replacement, you're right, yes. Um, yeah, I think, you know, for, for I think, to, to summarize it, and, and feel free to talk to me later outside, um, but to summarize it, um, I think for any level of, of paranoidness, you can get comfortable with the system as long as you're willing to exchange a couple of parts here and there, yeah. Further questions? Still have a couple minutes, so uh, feel free. Okay, if no one wants to ask. I have a question. Please. Because I'm interested in your build pipeline. You mentioned you have Raspberry Pis at home. Like, how do you ensure that if they uh, break or like if if a separate um, job comes along? How do you do the duplication of that? Right. Um, so there's actually locking in the coordinator. So the CI software, like the, the CI pipeline that's running on GitHub Actions, it talks to my coordinator at home and it tells it, look, um, I want to deploy this new image. Um, can you do it? And then either it immediately gets the lock and it has access to all of the devices, or it doesn't get it and then it just waits. And the reason why this needs the locking is that not only are these devices coordinated in terms of which software is running on them, but in fact they're also turned off 
to save power. So the coordinator actually uh, talks to a smart plug, which then turns on all of the devices, lets it boot, etc. Um, and then the CI pipeline only uses the energy that it really has to use, right? Um, but yeah, there's no sort of, you know, the, the, the jobs can't stomp over each other because there's locking involved here. Yep. Um, another question very front. <laughs> okay, the question was, which was the trickiest part I had to build and which one is the proudest part? I think uh, for the proudest, I'm just going to give you the, the origin story of how we built it, which was we were uh, sitting around at a Chaos Communication Congress at some point and we were like, uh, isn't it so super involved to have all of these uh, Linux uh, distribution installations that you need to manage? So one example we had at the point was like uh, back in 2013 when I did my last big house move, um, I set up uh, an installation on a Raspberry Pi and I just left it running for years and years without really updating it because it was so involved to update it and I didn't want to risk anything. So that was sort of like we were like, isn't there a better way? And then uh, a friend of mine was like, well, what do you really need? And I figured out, well, if we have the Linux kernel, could we just give it init equals and then a Go program that we statically build and cross-compile? And to statically build it, you just need cgo enabled equals zero, and to cross-compile, you just need the Go arch environment variable. So I just entered a simple command to my computer and out came a binary, and we just booted that up on a Pi, and it worked. And we were like, wow, that was way easier than we thought, right? Um, so could we just build the rest of the system that we need? And then it sort of spiraled from there, right? And then the trickiest part that we had to build was probably when Go did the transition from using Go path to using Go modules, because that really changed a couple of different things, in particular because we're sort of a downstream user that's built around the Go tool, right? Um, so you really need to be in tune with all of the nuances there. Um, and that also changed a little bit how everything is structured on disk. So that was sort of a, a bit of a disruptive change uh, from our perspective. Perspective, but I feel like at this point we have mostly gotten everything right, um, but we can talk about the details uh, if anyone wants to. Um, I think we might have time for one more question or so, so uh, don't be shy. Yeah, there are about five minutes left, so there's definitely room for more questions. Okay. Okay, but if you can't think of anything, as I said, feel free to approach me outside anytime, uh, talk to me about stuff, or just you know send me an email, open a GitHub issue. Uh, contributions are very welcome. Um, so I'm going to say thank you again, and see you all soon. Thank you very much.